My name is Nathaniel Rand. I guess you'd call me an office drone, a somewhat capable generalist who's most at home in antiseptic white collar environments and has never had any special skill except knowing how to get along in the cubicle life. The only difference between me and millions of other slacks wearing zombies is that I once worked in the Nordhagen building. 1060 Technology Lane, Blackhawk, Colorado, 45 minutes outside Denver. In my second week at Nordhagen as a marketing coordinator in 1998, a coworker named Billy Shell began to tell me all the stories about the building I would come to know so well. It was famous only to the people who worked there. A slowly changing roster of six or seven companies spread across just a few floors. The glass and brick building was situated at the tip of a maze of a dozen others built on a giant, boring loop. They were all depressingly alike, but everything on the loop was verdant and shaded. 1060 backed right up against the edge of Rocky Mountain National Park and deer wandered through the parking lot constantly, even a wild turkey once. Very nice tree-lined views out there in the middle of nowhere. And if I was outdoorsy at all, I could get on two long trails leading into the woods just a half mile from where I left my Honda Civic each morning. The real attraction of number 1060, though, Billy explained to me as we microwaved our lunches in Nordhagen's break room, was its history of the bazaar. I got three stories for you, I remember him saying that day, 21 years ago now. According to Billy, back in 1990, there was a poor customer service rep at a pharmaceutical call center on the second floor who kept getting these weird calls from a strange man named Rolf Berba. He would dial in and tell the rep that there were faces growing in the trees around the building. Building 1060. He called them crazy graveyard faces. He claimed he kept driving through the parking lot in the middle of the night to try to catch them growing. He made five or six calls over the course of a month. The rep could almost always hear in the background many dogs barking viciously. In his last call, the recording of which the rep's manager finally sent to the police, Burba said the faces had crawled inside his head. That afternoon, the day before the July 4th holiday, a couple of people at Nordhagen were looking out the window of the head accountant's office and noticed a beat-up gray Oldsmobile cruising around and around the parking lot very slowly at about five miles per hour in a meaningless rectangle again and again. Ten minutes later, someone reported that the car had driven into the trees over near the south entrance. A bunch of people ran out under the hot sun and saw a man, later identified as Rolf Berba, slumped behind the wheel, engine still running. The doors locked, the windows rolled up. Somebody called 911. The first responders had to break him out of there. The interior vents were closed. Burba had gotten into his car, and on this 90-degree day, he'd driven slowly and steadily for about 35 minutes until he'd lost consciousness and then died, suffocating, having deliberately entombed himself. There was an 8.5 by 11 piece of paper wildly overtaped to the steering wheel. On it was a primitive yet elaborate pencil sketch of a tree with dozens of human faces hanging from the branches, all with their eyes closed. And what was the deal with this guy, Burba? I asked Billy. But he just said, oh, the boring backstory is never the point of this stuff. And a week later, he described the story of the ghost. The ghost was a phenomenon from the mid-80s, around the time Technology Lane was first built. A woman at a now-defunct engineering firm 
had been working late on the third floor of 1060, in the huge suite across a common area from Nordhagen. And she'd gone into one of its conference rooms for one reason or another, but then backed out again. She'd seen an unfamiliar man sitting at the head of the conference table, staring emptily into space, palms flat on the table. He was mostly bald, wearing a white button-up shirt and tie. He was unresponsive when the woman had said something to him, didn't even move his eyes. He seemed frozen. There had never been any security staff in the building, no main front desk on the first floor, so she locked herself in her office and called the police as she watched the hallway, knowing that this man would have to move right past her window to get off the third floor. But when they came, they found no one. About 15 months later, an outfit on the first floor called Executive Choice Real Estate staged its annual Christmas party in the office, 30 or 40 people milling around with appetizers and beer. And afterward, the receptionist had lingered, cleaning up and checking a few messages. Looking down the long hallway that went past a couple of dozen offices, she saw a man standing under an exit sign, seeming to watch her. Medium height and weight, tie and white shirt, slacks, balding. She didn't recognize him. She raised a hand to him, no response. She turned away, and when she turned back, she was struck with a vision the likes of which she had never had before. That same man had been divided into pieces all around the hallway, neat, bloodless pieces like he was made of plastic or porcelain. His head on the carpet, a leg stuck to the wall somehow, a foot sitting on the round reception desk just a few feet from her. Half of his torso in one place, the other half in another. And then just as quickly he was gone. It was all gone. That's all there really is to that, Billy said. But the two sightings were enough to make everyone's imaginations run wild. Billy theorized the ghost might be the chief financial officer of the first company ever to sign a lease at 1060. Only a year afterward, he died just a few miles away from the building, having gotten lost in the woods near Dakota Hill and trapped by a snowstorm. Whoever the phantom may have been, everyone at Nordhagen seemed to know of someone who had encountered him over the years, though no one could actually confirm seeing him, naturally. Billy had the tact to wait another week to tell me the last horror tale about building 1060. This one originated within Nordhagen product analysts itself. During an afternoon break, Billy took me to the stairwell leading up to the unoccupied fourth floor. If you went straight through a door at the top of the stairs, you'd find yourself in the huge, unleased office suite. If you took a left, as we did that day, you wound up at a dead end in a door with no markings. Billy opened it and ushered me inside a very small, utterly empty room with cement walls painted light green. Six years before, an editorial assistant named Danny had popped into that empty room an hour ahead of giving a presentation to his team. He was nervous about it and wanted to run through its intro all alone. He noticed that one of the big cement bricks had been removed from one of the walls creating a rectangular gap leading into hollow darkness. He was curious, so he got close to it. And he could hear voices from far away, as if from deep within the wall. The voices belonged to two women who claimed to have been buried inside the foundation of the building. They were sisters, they said. When Danny offered to go get help, they said it was far too late. It had happened years and years ago, and now they were dead. When Danny did return with someone, the voices did not return. No one seemed to remember any follow-up or how or when the hole was filled back in. 
Billy pointed out to me the inconsistency in the paint where it had been. He had a fascination with all the stories, he said, and others like them, because his father had once experienced on a farm in Kansas back in the 30s something horrible and unreal, something Billy swore to tell me about someday, someday, but he never did. The three unrelated stories about Building 1060, he told me, were somewhat corroborated, somewhat, sort of, over the first six months I worked there, as I brought them up with people I felt comfortable with. But a guy down the hall from me told me that Danny, the editorial assistant, had long had problems balancing several medications and had experienced a breakdown the year before. Someone else told me there had been only one true sighting of the alleged ghost and that he'd actually haunted the elevator. A third person said Rolf Berba had simply died of a heart attack, not killed himself in that strange way inside his car. And there was no twisted drawing in there. Variations on all these stories were rampant. People had additional legends to explain why the floor above us, the fourth, had never been occupied. But I thought a weak economy was probably to blame. I was a skeptic, and I didn't really believe any of what I was told. But I was thankful, at least, that 1060 had been given just a little bit of flavor, because my tedious job at Nordhagen certainly had none. What happened to me there happened in early December of 1999. It was a Saturday. I had left work early on Friday for a doctor's appointment, and I was worried about falling behind on a sales project. I knew I'd feel stressed all day Sunday if I didn't do something about it, so I decided to drive to the office to get some folders and work on them back at home, which wasn't unusual. But I had to wait until some snow passed through and didn't turn into anything major. There were three inches on the ground as I drove the ten miles to Technology Lane, but nothing more seemed to be coming. It was about 8.15, three hours past nightfall, when I got to the loop. Mine was the only car in the parking lot of 1060. I have to say, I'd been having a strange feeling about the building for about two weeks. It was because of how its look had been transformed due to a round of major renovations taking place on the west side. The building had always had a black, almost featureless facade, the kind you don't even notice. But I remember a drizzly day when I had been standing outside the front entrance at about five, waiting for Billy to come down so I could carpool home with him, and looking up at the glass and the brick building and being surprised at how indefinably eerie it had suddenly become. At that point, the renovations had resulted in the removal of some high upper windows and a lot of brickwork. And transparent plastic sheeting covered almost the whole northwest corner of the place. It rustled in the wind a lot and looked to me like an enormous tourniquet masking a wound. I thought I was being irrational until Billy joined me on the sidewalk and got kind of mesmerized by the sight. He said that the sheeting reminded him of what his father had gone through so long ago in Kansas, but he stopped there. Seen from our angle, the edge of the building was backdropped by a bleak, bruised sky and those tall, secretive trees on the edge of the forest. A bit of haunted house atmosphere in white-collar surroundings. On the night I'm talking about, I swiped my keycard and entered the building. No lights were on in the lobby, which was very cold. The workmen had to go in and out of the back of the building so often, they'd taken to propping the loading doors open. And after a few hours of that every day, you could really feel the difference. They must have been working that day then, I thought, here on the weekend, and someone must still be inside somewhere, maybe a whole crew, but there was no distant sound of tools being operated. 
Three construction trucks sat against the curb, but they hadn't moved for days. I was paranoid about getting trapped in the building's spotty elevators, with no one around to come rescue me, so I took the stairs to the third floor instead. The door into the stairwell was propped open. Lots of paint cans were stacked in the nook under the steps. I didn't like being in the stairwell because of the emergency lights. They gave everything a sick, intense red glow. It was like being in a photographer's dark room. It was like that on the third floor, too, where there was no entry-exit door at all. The stairs merely opened right onto it. I'd never seen the emergency lights on here before, but then I'd never been in the building on the weekend or late at night. I swiped my key card again and, through a set of glass doors, entered Nord Hagen's reception area and went down the hallway, feeling like a red alien in a badly lit sci-fi movie. I decided to help myself to a cup of coffee from the nice machine our CEO had bought for us. Why not? I turned the lights on in the break room. It felt strange to have them on when I was surrounded by so much darkness. From there, I walked into what we called the fishbowl, a conference room with two glass walls. And I looked out over the parking lot, just for the view. Flurries were still coming down. The sky over the forest was lifeless. Some gray swirling in all that black. I left there and walked to my office, hit the lights, grabbed the folders I needed, and then foolishly decided on a coffee refill back in the break room. In reaching for the creamer, I knocked my cup over directly onto my pile of folders. Releasing a volley of profanity, I scrambled for the paper towels, and of course, as in every office kitchen across America, no one had replaced the empty roll. I didn't even know where they were kept. I grabbed the folders and barged out the side door directly near the elevator bank, where the bathrooms were set into little niches. I squinted in that bath of red light and punched the four-digit door code, which I still remember to this day, 1919. I carried the folders to the sink, needing to work fast before some documents very important to me were ruined. Under the white fluorescence, I managed to save almost all of them but it took a giant stack of those cruddy, light brown, rectangular, folded paper sheets, which I used to dab the pages over and over again, trying to be delicate. I was proud of my patience. I was at it for almost 10 minutes. Then I stuck the folders in the crook of my arm again and got ready to move to the door. That was when I heard something from just beyond that door. First came a small thump, like a heavy weight had leaned against it for just a moment. Then a single, low, wet, snorting sound, made by something big. At almost the same moment, I detected an odor from out there, a a dank earthy smell with an undertone of meat that was going bad. It was extraordinary, I think, how still I became, unblinking, unbreathing. I know it's hyperbole, but I want to say I slowed the very blood in my veins. There was utter silence for several seconds, almost ten, I would say. And then I heard that clumsy shifting of weight again. Little by little, the not-quite-foul odor dissipated. I heard no footsteps. Standing safely in an enclosure that couldn't be entered without a code, I had a lot of time to think through all the possibilities and permutations of what had appeared beyond the door. That it was some kind of animal, I was almost sure. I kept coming back to an extraordinary possibility, which, as random and as uncanny as it was, made sense. 
I tried to deny it to myself, but even with my brain and my heart racing almost out of control, I knew that I had to stop and consider it seriously. I thought about the draft that had pervaded the bottom floor, the open loading doors from which it had come, and about the door to the stairwell down there which had been propped open. I thought about Rocky Mountain National Park beside us and its wildlife population and how so few of us had ever gone down the trail that led off a nearby parking lot, even for lunchtime stroll, because everyone knew, of course, that we truly were neighbors with the wild, even tenants of the wild out there on the loop that had been cut out of it. We knew that people camped and hiked and got lost only a mile or so from our parking lot, and that the woods held within them everything that lived out here at the base of the mountains. That snorting sound, not like anything I'd heard before. That was a bear, I thought to myself. And you know it was a bear. Maybe like the one Jeannie Milleth, a graphic designer, had told me bluff charged her and her boyfriend in September on Bald Mountain. A black bear that had scared them so badly in a sudden rainstorm, she still had nightmares about it. On the night I stood trapped in that bathroom, it was the beginning of hibernation season, and of course there was always a part of the bear population that became anxious and desperate if the feeding hadn't been sufficient the previous weeks, likely to behave erratically and wander well outside their normal hunting grounds in search of food. They were almost always docile, but one driven to pursue sustenance to an extreme might not be. And it would have to be truly desperate to come into our building through doors kept open against the walls. I couldn't eliminate the possibility that it had smelled me from far away and maybe had even been trying to find me for as long as I'd been inside the building, stalking me, maybe even from the moment I'd gotten out of my car. A black bear's killing ability was immense. There was nothing to do but wait. So wait is exactly what I did, standing beside the sink immobile. I considered the layout beyond that bathroom door. Just a few steps outside it to the right was the stairwell that had no door at all. To the left, the niche where the women's bathroom was, and then a short run of hallway opening up at a bank of elevators. Nordhagen and the engineering firm on the other side of the common area were safely locked. I would say it was a full half hour before I worked up the nerve to abandon my folders on the sink and walk toward the bathroom door. I pressed my ear against it and spent another ten minutes just listening. The only sound was the faint buzz of the fluorescence above me. I turned the doorknob and pushed just a few inches. That grim, essence-sucking red light crept in. I inhaled deeply, but I smelled nothing. I pushed the door open a little further, enough to stick my head out into the niche where the door to the men's room was recessed, and I became a statue again. I didn't want to try to make it to the entrance of our office suite, because the elevator bank was around a corner cut off from my sight line. I might have to swipe my key card more than once before the electronic impulse allowed me in, and then I would have to move several more feet to my left to grasp the door handle. Option two was moving into the stairwell that was so close to my right. To get to safety, I just have to move up one twisting flight to the empty fourth floor, which was barred by a door that had been unlocked for as long as I could remember, and why shouldn't it have been? That door, Billy had told me, was just there to make the fourth floor, the penthouse suite as it were, seem more private, secure, and desirable to prospective tenants. 
It would take maybe five seconds to reach it and get through. But once upstairs, I'd likely find no working telephone if I wanted to call someone for help. What I was scared to try was the downward route. Three twisting flights in the darkness with a bad sight line around every corner, leading to a long run out the entrance, probably as much as 30 seconds to get out and more blind spots on the way than I wanted to imagine. I pushed the bathroom door open all the way and let it close behind me with unbearable slowness, trying to minimize that click as it shut. I crept beyond the niche. After a half hour of exposure to harsh white light, my retinas could make out even less detail out of the red darkness than before. I slipped into the stairwell to my right. If I'd had any thoughts about trying to improvise and make my way down to the lobby, they ended when I saw how that route seemed to have swallowed the light entirely. It was so black down there, an effect I know now must have been a mostly psychological barrier, because that's where I had just come from. Once I made my final decision, I was quick. Eight steps up to the pivot stair, eight more up to the door, taking two at a time, just barely able to see my feet. I yanked on the door, and yes, it opened easily. I pulled it behind me fast, and the latch clicked home. The fourth floor was bathed, not in red emergency lighting, but only the paltry glow off mandatory exit signs mounted to the ceiling tiles. I moved a few steps into a wide, central corridor, a long, long straightaway to the northern edge of the building. I could see almost all the way down it, past two dozen empty offices, because here there was natural moonlight. All the office doors were open, and that moonlight came in through their plentiful wide windows the ones that held the best views of the forest. It was cold, colder than it had even been down in the lobby. Plastic sheeting blocked off many of the office doors on the west side of the hall, but some of it hadn't been properly fastened or sealed, and each sheet rustled like a dress, billowing out into the hall. In that moment, At about 9.20 p.m., I walked forward on the musty carpet in the hopes of finding a phone connected somewhere. Looking to my left and right as I went past all those office doors, the offices were barren, all of them, though sometimes temporary wooden supports and half walls draped with ever more plastic sheeting had been constructed within. I was halfway to the end of the corridor, exactly halfway, I believe, when someone came out of a room about 40 feet away, a very tall, thin man in a heavy winter coat. A member of the work crew, I figured. There was no other explanation. I slowed my step and raised a hand in a wave. I felt a huge surge of relief not to be alone. I walked forward and said, we need to stay here for now. There might be an animal, a big animal down on three. And he said, oh, it's nice up here. I want to stay. I want to stay. There was something about him, aside from his manner, that made me stop. He was missing his right shoe. That's it. That's all there was about him physically, to sour my feeling of relief and give me a sense that this person was not to be approached. His pace forward was much slower than mine, as if he wanted time to evaluate me. 
something caught my attention off to the right. I was next to a room bigger than most of the others, a conference room with no furniture or ornamentation inside it, but a long blank whiteboard mounted to one wall. I looked into that room for no more than three seconds by my calculation, and I have calculated many times. What I saw in that room was so awful. My terror spiked to such a degree that it was great enough, a doctor told me later, to physically damage my heart. I took an involuntary step backward. The man in the heavy winter coat at the end of the hall saw my reaction to the room, and he began to come faster. I turned and ran. I heard the man's labored, strangely high-pitched breathing as he came after me, and I heard the weight of his footsteps on the carpet. It was six seconds at most until I got to the door to the stairwell. I hit it hard. From my side, it opened outward, and sometimes I wonder if the extra second that would have been required to open it inward might have cost me my life. I slammed the door behind me. My momentum did not wane. I plunged downward into the darkness, almost blind, the red light pouring over me. Down four bending flights of stairs, one hand on the rail beside me for balance, praying I didn't collide suddenly with something big and heavy. Once out of the stairwell, I blundered through a short passageway into the lobby not looking anywhere but straight ahead. I ran for the glass doors and was quickly out into the parking lot after hitting the push bar so frantically that I sprained my left ring finger requiring a splint. The best statement on the condition of my mind at that moment was that I pulled on the front door of my car four times with rising fury and confusion until I remembered that yes, it took a key to open it, the key in my front pocket. I finally looked behind me. The building was dark and silent. Nothing was coming, neither man nor animal. My car started smoothly, and I started to drive to the loop. And I did see him, finally, my pursuer. Just a tall black shape behind the glass entrance doors, looking out, inert, knowing he had been too slow and that I couldn't be head. I hit the brakes and we looked at each other, making out what little we could. Then I hit the gas and got out of there. Three miles away I stopped at an Exxon station and made the call. The police went right in through the open loading doors of 1060, but were unable to save the victim they discovered in the conference room on the fourth floor. The man in the winter coat was named Timothy Geiger, and he'd been living in Rocky Mountain National Park for several weeks when the onset of true winter forced him out of it. Wandering without a map, he came across a side trail that emerged from the woods less than half a mile to 1060 Technology Lane and its loading doors, which were unwisely left unsecured. Geiger who had three battery convictions on his record, had realized the fourth floor had possibilities as a temporary shelter as long as he could stay hidden. The police found traces of his pathetic existence up there in different rooms. Geiger confessed that at about 3.30 p.m. on December 4th, about five hours before I entered the building, He'd been surprised by a construction worker named Richard Osby, who'd been bringing materials up the freight elevator. Perceiving that Osby was going to call the police, Geiger had knocked him to the floor and stabbed him 30 times. But the sight of Osby's body on the conference room carpet, shocked that it was, was not what had caused me to almost lose my mind. 
even though in the moonlight I had just been able to see the horrible wounds on his chest and neck, and the way his face was entirely masked by a thick layer of blood. It looked like he'd bought a cheap devil's face from a costume shop. Now, I had fled down the hallway because standing over that corpse was a man in a short-sleeved white shirt, tie, and dark slacks. He had a small to medium build and was mostly bald. He was looking directly at me. That's the part, of course, that I replay in my mind the most. I never reported that site to the police when we arrived at the site of the killing. Because even before I'd left the gas station to return to 1060 and meet them, I knew that they'd never find any businessman up there or anywhere else on Technology Lane. I knew what I'd seen was not a living entity. Because in the dark, I should not have been able to see as much of his eyes as I somehow did. They were empty of all life, humanity, awareness, consciousness, understanding. They were completely dead. During his confession, Geiger was asked why he didn't pursue me through the door up there, why he had stopped. His answer was that he thought someone was behind him, but he never said more. As for the bear, there was no evidence that there ever was one, except for what I heard and what I sensed and smelled. I've listened to many recordings of black bear vocalizations in the wild since then trying to make the connection in my memory, and I've come to the conclusion that there is little other possibility, that that's what it was. My wife, the only person in the world I've told the whole story to, including what I truly saw in the conference room, woke me up in the middle of the night, a week after my revelations to her, sat up in bed, and said, maybe there were two ghosts that night, and one of them was only there to push me toward the fourth floor. I never went back to work at Nordhagen. I cynically used this incident to bow out of being an office drone for them. But today, which is an overcast winter Sunday, while here in Denver to conduct a training seminar, I drove back to Technology Lane, getting there at just past four in the afternoon. Nothing's really changed, though the renovations in Building 1060 were of course completed almost two decades ago. You can still take the trail toward Rocky Mountain National Park from just beyond the parking lot of Building 1024. The looming top edge of my building still looked eerie to me against the cold white sky. The building directory outside finally lists a fourth floor tenant, one of the bigger web security companies in Colorado. And as I found out recently when reconnecting with my old friend Billy Shell online, people at Nordhagen are still collecting tales. Mine is one, naturally. There's one more person I'm going to reveal everything to, I think. Everything I saw in the conference room, not just the body of Richard Osby. I'm getting together for a drink with Billy tonight. He's still in the area, but works for Sage Hospitality now. And I want to propose a swap to him. Tell me what happened to your father in the 1930s, I'll say. And I'll give you some interesting information from that night in December of 1999. Maybe even the fact that there was a wide, inch-deep bed of snow around that businessman's feet, and Osby lay nestled in it. 
something else the police never saw, nor were aware of. Let two white-collar drones give each other something to think about during our long days of spreadsheets and performance reviews and team huddles. I haven't seen Billy since the Friday before my night of terror. But I know from talking to him on the phone that he's the same. He always needed to relate these stories, needed to believe in them. And I know he'll order a drink for us both, look at me with amused but knowing eyes, and say, listen.